right. Well, good to see you all. We're going to go on with uh, we're going to go on with Samson and his various escapades. So um, let's uh, let's just start with with a prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you and we come to worship you and your dear Son, and we come to your Word to be taught, and we pray that you'll open our eyes to it. And we ask, Father, that you will bless each and every one of us, that we might truly hear your voice and go your way. And not the way of the world or the way of the flesh, but your way. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you will be with each of us in the stuff we have given by you in our lives to develop us. We pray for Cowan with her stomach pains. We pray for Patrick. Pray for Corrine with her arm and with her bladder. And we pray, Father, that soon your son will be here to end war and to to establish your kingdom. And we pray for my dad with all his issues and those of us who try and look after him. We pray, Father, that you will be with each of us and that, that we might respond to each of these things as you would have us do, always thinking, what would Jesus do? So please, Father, speak to us now for the sake of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Right, so... <coughs> We, we went through Samson, right? And so far in the Samson story, Israel is dominated by the Philistines and then God has raised up Samson to, to kind of save them from, from the Philistines. And so he, uh, he comes and he, he's, um, he's been raised up by God. He's given the spirit of God to, to fight the Philistines. But he then goes down to Timnah and falls in love with a Philistine girl. It's not, it's an anti-climax. You think, oh, hang, you know, Samson, come on, mate. You're supposed to be saving your people from the Philistines and you start hooning around with their women. Well, it all goes a bit weird because he, uh, on the way down there, a, a lion, to, it's like four miles away from where he grew up, a lion roars against him and he, he gets the spirit of God to kill the lion. And when he comes back to the lion, there's bees inside the carcass, and he eats the honey. And this was to show him, you know, Samson, those Philistines are like the lion. I'll give you my spirit. You can, you can overcome them. No worries. Well, he goes to this, this girl, and uh, they have a, a drinking party for seven days. He's a Nazirite to God, and he's not supposed to drink alcohol, so that's a strange thing to do. And it just shows that God, despite Samson's weakness, worked with him. Well, during the drinking party, he gives them uh, a riddle. He says, basically, out of the strong, and he means the lion, they came forth something sweet. What's that? And the answer was honey out of the carcass of a lion. But nobody would guess that because bees don't hive in carcasses. Well, in the, and he says, if you, if you guess it, then I've got to give you 30 changes of clothing. But if you, get, but if you can't, you've got to give me 30 changes of clothing. So it wasn't a great... It wasn't a great deal. And so his wife, though they come to his wife and say, come on, get the secret out of him. And during the part of the wedding party, well, she wears him down and he tells her. And they say, ah, it's honey out of a lion. Okay, he says, right. And he gets fuming mad with his wife, he gets really angry with it, and he goes down uh, to another village and kills 30 blokes, 30 Philistines, takes their clothes off them and says, oh, there you are, there's your 30 changes of clothing. He is best man... His best man then ends up marrying this girl. So, it's a, don't tell me the Bible's uh, boring. I mean, you, you can't make this stuff up, can you? So he then goes back home, and he's very, very angry. And you ask yourself, well, what should he have done? Well, he shouldn't have been marrying a Philistine. He should have thought, well, that was a bit of a bad deal. Uh, all those people down there in that village, they're real funny people, and I'll thank you, God, that you preserved me from a bad marriage. Sure, we've all had bad relationships, and uh, where you don't take it any further, and you think, oh, God, thank you that you saved me from that, that cow or that terrible bloke or <laughs> whatever it was. Thank you, God. You'd have thought that's what he would have done. But no, after a while, it's a sort of anticlimax. You think, okay, Samson, so you messed up. But okay, God got you out of it. She married your best man, and what a bad lot they were. All right, come on, Samson, come on, save us from the Philistines. 
And now you read, he basically goes down there and wants sex with this woman again. Let's read it. You can't make this stuff up, I'll tell you. But after a while, in the time of wheat harvest, Samson visited his wife with a young goat. Instead of bringing her flowers, he took her a goat. Well, fair enough. He said, I will go and sleep with my wife into the bedroom. But her father wouldn't allow him to go in. Her father said, I saw you utterly hated her. Therefore, I gave her to your best man. Isn't her younger sister more beautiful than she? Please take her instead. It's almost like that he does not care about um, his daughters. Well, exactly, yeah. Good on you. Good on you. That's <laughs> right. So, uh, then Samson gets really mad. And he says, I will be blameless of harm to the Philistines. I'm now going to really hurt them. You think, look, Samson, mate, <laughs> get real. You've got an anger problem. He had an anger problem. He, he, right, he hates this, this girl that he was supposed to marry, but he should have seen he shouldn't have been marrying her anyway because she was an unbeliever. She was a Philistine, and he's, he's supposed to be saving Israel from the Philistines. And then he comes to her and he wants sex with her. Well, hello, Samson. Just get it. But he doesn't. The kid don't get it. He's just blinded with lust and with anger. And yet, what we're going to see in this very strange story is that God uses him. He uses the guy's anger. He, yeah, I can understand him in one sense being angry, but I, you know, I, I was all set to marry this, this girl, and my best man, who was a Philistine, ends up marrying her. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, oh, and now, well, well, anyway, I want to have sex with you. Don't I? Look, mate, she's married to somebody else now. And he gets angry about it. He's just got an angry, an anger problem. So he went and caught, verse 4, 300 foxes and took torches, tied them tail to tail in pairs, and put a firebrand between each pair of tails. When he had set the brands on fire, he let them go into the standing grain of the Philistines and burnt up both the sheaves and the standing grain and also the vineyards. This would have been absolutely crippling, crippling. You can get another chair from the bar next door, mate, if you want another... Of the chair. This would have been crippling for, for the Philistines. This was their harvest, burnt up. They weren't going to get any food now. They're going to be hungry for ages. Yeah. Right, kids going hungry, all the rest of it. It's a pretty extreme thing to do, but he's just that mad with them. Well, does it say in the Bible that love your enemy as yourself? <laughs> right, the Bible says love your enemy as yourself. Well done. Do you want to stand up here, David, and take over from me? <laughs> I'll go and buy myself a Coke at the bar. Right, so... <clears throat> exactly. Is this what he should have done? Well, no. But he, he's just driven by this anger. Well, just a minute... <laughs> He was given the Spirit of God to do this. You try catching a fox. We've got loads of foxes here in South London, right? I've got you, one living next door to me. You've got one living next door to you. Yeah. Right. Well, you Freddy, I'll call him. Freddy. And Freddy Fox. Freddy Fox. <laughs> right. Well, you imagine catching 300 foxes. You can't, I couldn't even catch one. This was clearly by the Spirit of God. So although he's mad angry... God also wants to settle his deal with the Philistines. And so God works through the guy's anger problem. But it's not right to be flaming, fuming, angry like this and lustful and all the rest of it. But God works through it. So in other words, when God sees sin, he doesn't say, ooh, oh, I'm out of here with you. He still works with people. And people say to me, oh, you know what I'm like, I always say to people, come on, mate, be baptised in the Jesus Spirit. say, ah... You know what, I've got this problem, I've got that problem, I've got, I've got an addiction, I've got this, I've got that. I, I, I'm not, you know, no, God wouldn't want a guy like me. Well, that's not to say that, oh, that's fine, don't worry about it, carry on, enjoy your, you know, your addiction. No, no, of course not. But it is also not necessarily a deal breaker because God wants to work with you. That's the thing. He who began a good work in you will complete it and will keep on trying, trying with you. So he catches these foxes and ties their tails together. I have no idea how he managed to do that. And puts a firebrand between their tails and sends them off to scamper around, burning everything down. Isn't he just blaming a fox for something they did? Well, 
I think that a fox, foxes don't hunt in packs. They're always loners. They're always loners. It's, they're not like jackals, for example, that hunt in packs. Foxes, as we all know, because we're all living in South London, these guys are always on their own. And so the power of the Spirit of God came upon him to catch these things, put them together in pairs, use them as a sort of a, you know, as a group to, to go and burn down all the Philistines' corn. Samson was a loner. He's never recorded as having any, any army behind him. He's never recorded as having any friends. He's always on his own. And when he goes down to marry his first wife, he goes for a walk. He's with his mum and dad. But he goes for a walk in the vineyard on his own. It's like the three of them are walking down. And he says to mum and dad, well, they may be stopped for a sandwich. And he says, well, I'm just going for a walk. He goes for a walk. Oh, a lion attacks him. He kills a lion. But he doesn't tell them that he killed the lion. And then next time I go down actually to the wedding, he's going down again with mum and dad, and they, well, they stop again for a sandwich, I suppose. And again he goes to walk in the vineyards on his own. And he finds, oh, there's a lion I killed. Oh, uh, whoops, inside the carcass there's a load of bees and honey. Whoa. He's a loner. He's, he's a loner. And when he makes the riddle and is... is Bride says to him, oh, come on, Samson, tell me the riddle. He says, I didn't even tell my parents the, the riddle. What should I tell you? So he's like a man on his own. And the Spirit of God comes upon him to get these foxes who are loners, foxes are loners, and to, to use them to do his work. And I think, again, God is trying to teach him something. You can't do it on your own. And so you see how it goes, that God works very gently in our lives. Some people got this idea that God is like, you know, oh, whoosh, unless I've got Holy Spirit doing miracles, doing, jumping out of, you know, rabbits jumping out of hats, talking in tongues, and righty da oh, then, then God's not active. No, no, what I notice is that God is very active, but in little ways. Nudge, nudge, hint, hint, do this, don't do that. Meet this person, meet that person, etc. And so you also wonder why, why there's 300 foxes with firebrands. Well, shortly before the time of Samson, there had been a judge called Gideon who also saved Israel. And he saved Israel with 300 men. And those 300 men defeated the Midianites by holding firebrands in their hands. And he also, Gideon, he offers a young goat to God. Samson offers a young goat, has 300 foxes, you know, why not 351 or 400 with uh, firebrands on them? Yeah, he's imitating Gideon. And here you see Samson, it's typical, his flesh and spirit. Yeah, on one hand, he's doing the right thing. On one hand, he's, he's not wrong, he's doing the right thing. He's, he's, uh, doing God's work against the Philistines. On the other hand, the guy is just driven by lust, anger, personal vengeance. I'm going to hit you back because you, I didn't like you know, what happened with my first wife. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you've all met so many people who had a marriage and it went bitterly wrong. And they're so bitter and twisted because of how their first marriage went. They're just cranky, bitter, angry, difficult people. And all they can think about is their ex. They might be married multiple times after that, but they're, they're bitter as because of their, their first marriage. And they, they don't get over it. And he was the same. He just couldn't get over it. That my best man married the girl that I was supposed to marry. Oh, no, you know? And so all that side of it was wrong. And yet God works through him. And Samson, on the other half of his brain, is thinking, if you like, about the Bible, is thinking about... The faithful who went before me, Gideon, I want to copy them. I want to copy him. And you see how mixed up we all are, flesh and spirit. And yet, as I said last time, and I keep on saying, Hebrews 11 and the New Testament gives you a list of many of the faithful people who will be saved, and Samson is among them. Samson is going to be saved. He's one of God's men. 
And you only read his life, you think, oh dear, this guy was way out. And yet, why have we got this here in the Bible? It's a very strange story of Samson. It's to encourage us that no matter how mixed up you all feel, I feel, you feel, you know, that if in your heart you are really totally with the Lord and you want to go his way, all that stuff to some degree God sees as the surface level stuff. Now, I'm not saying continue in sin. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that Samson is a great comfort to us. Um, that he's going to be saved. So, the Philistines said, who has done this? They said, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because his wife was given her to his companion, to his best man. So the Philistines came up and burnt her and her father with fire. Well, you would have thought that Samson now is satisfied. Right, that girl I married who I uh, didn't like, well, now she's been burnt with fire. So it serves her right. For two time in me, for all the rest of it, even though next minute he's earlier, he won't have sex with her, but anyway. Um, and then, but then, again, he doesn't leave it there. His anger comes out. He goes, ah, if you've behaved like this, surely I, I will be avenged on you. He attacked them viciously and slaughtered many of them. Then he went down and lived in the cave in the Rock of Etam. Wait a minute, Samson. Um, oh, he's, he's mortally upset. He's very, very upset. You guys uh, burnt my, my wife with fire. Well, yeah, she'd betrayed you. She'd married your best man. I understand you're a bit annoyed about that. Um, and so, well, you went and burnt down a load of their corn. And so, well, the Philistines burnt her and her dad with fire. Um, oh, no, I'm mortally offended. Oh, like his anger gets triggered. Oh, man, he goes out and he viciously kills loads of Philistines. And he says, I will be avenged on you. You know, frankly, what we would like to hear is, and Samson said, I'm sorry, God, for the, my marriage and all that stuff. She's dead now. Um, I'm, I'm going to turn over a new leaf. I'm going to be your man to save Israel from the Philistines. But now what does he do? Now, he gets mad about that. He's a bloke with an anger problem. He really he's got mental health, I would say. He, he needed some counselling. He needed to take a few chill pills. But I will be avenged. I will be avenged. There's nothing here about the glory of God. And actually at the end of his life, we're going to see in chapter 16, he gets involved with another bad woman who betrays him to the Philistines and she gets out of him the secret of his strength, which is that he had long hair. So he got long hair as well. Um, that he had long hair. And so he says, yeah, it's because I've got long hair. Oh, so she gets his hair cut off. She's... He becomes weak, and the Philistines come and gouge out his eyes, and he's eyeless in prison. <clears throat> but then, at the very last bit of the story, his strength comes back, and they take him to the temple of their god, Dagon. He says, oh, God, give me strength. And he says, I, I want to kill all these people by pushing the, uh, the pillars apart so that the temple fell down on them. And he said, I want to do this so that I might be avenged for my two eyes. Vengeance. No. There's no sense. It's all personal. It's me, me, me. It's all about me, you know? And he really presents badly, I would say. Personal vengeance. And in fact, the whole story of Samson is about, well, four or five incidents in the guy's life where he's simply driven by personal anger, vengeance, uh, mixed-up kid syndrome, basically. But God uses that. God uses that and does not give up with him, does not leave that as a deal-breaker. So, he attacked them viciously and slaughtered many of them. Then he went down and lived in a cave in the Rock of Etam. The Philistines went up. To him, uh, you're going to read the, ge the, the you're going to read the geography a bit later. Whenever you read a man going down, that's not good. Like when he marries the girl the first time, we're told twice he went down to the Philistines. And here, likewise, even though he's going to live in a cave up a mountain, it says he went down. So, yeah, he went down. 
Uh, I guess his conscience was working on him. He's on his own, he's living in a cave. He's supposed to be leading Israel. He's supposed to be basically the judge and the leader of Israel. But a bloke lives in a cave. Okay. Well, then the Philistines went up because they were fed up with him. And they camped in Judah, spread themselves in Lehi. The men of Judah said, why have you come up against us? They said, we've come up to take Samson prisoner, to do to him as he has done to us. Well, that's the old thing you hear in every school playground. We're gonna, I'm going to do to you as you did to me. Then 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cave in the rock of Etam. Now, the Judah, men of Judah, these are Israelites, are on Samson's side. 3,000 of them. And they said to Samson, don't you know that the Philistines are rulers over us? What is this that you've done to us? He said to them, as they did to me, so have I done to them. That's just what the Philistines said. You see the end of verse 10? We've come to take Samson to do to him as he did to us. And then the men of Judah say to Samson, well, what's going on here? And he said, oh, well, I, I just did to them as they did to me. Wait a minute. They burnt his wife or his ex-wife. And so he burns up acres of, of, of uh, wheat. He totally, he totally wrecks them. And so what you see there is what happens all the time. If you believe in eye for an eye, you say, right, you did that to me, so I will do that back to you, but more. Oh, you did that to me. Oh, I will do that to you and more. You, you see this in every school playground. You see it in families. You're seeing it what's going on at the moment with Israel and their wars with, with Hezbollah, with Hamas. Oh, you killed a thousand of our people? Oh, well, right, we'll take out 40,000. We'll take out 40,000 of you guys. You dare to fire 10 missiles at us. We will fire 100 missiles and much bigger ones at you. And so it goes on and on and on. And that's the trouble with eye for an eye. Lex Talonis, that I will do to you as you did to me. The doing back to the other person never stays there. It's always what they did to you, plus. Plus. Yeah. Two wrongs don't make a right. Two wrongs don't make a right. Exactly. Thank you. Absolutely. But you, what I'm saying is that somebody does something bad. And then you, if you're going to pay them back, Inevitably, you will pay them back what they did plus something. And then, oh, you did, they are going to say, you did that to me. Right, I'm going to do that to you. At plus something more. And so it goes on. Father, yes, yes. Father Bible didn't say that. He said if someone smacked you on the cheek and turned the other cheek to them. The well, yeah, of course. Do that, kind the, of take that kind of revenge. The Lord Jesus said it was said by them of old time, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, hmm. forgive uh, and so forth. So what, what, what you see here is, is so psychologically credible. People say to me, why do you believe the Bible is true? And there's a lot of answers to that, but I would say because it's so psychologically credible. This is exactly what goes on. And of course, straight away, you think of Jesus saying that people said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say unto you, forgive your enemies. So Samson is out of step with the Spirit of Christ, most definitely. And these men of Judah, there's 3,000 of them, I guess 3,000 soldiers. And they say to Samson, don't you know the Philistines are rulers over us? So what do you do this for? Right, there were 3,000 men of Judah, and God had said that the land, he had given it to Israel. And he had given them power to overcome the Philistines. And they've got 3,000 men. But it seems that only 1,000 Philistines came to grab Samson because he kills, he kills them all. He kills 1,000 of them. They've got the potential to actually be free of the Philistines. There's 3,000 of them. There's only 1,000 of the Philistines. But they're like, oh, no, 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 the Philistines are rulers over us. Oh, no, 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 no. We, we can't imagine freedom. And so it is with so many people. They can't imagine that there could be another way. That you don't have to live... You know, just chasing your tail, just chasing your tails in, in this life. You don't have to. There is another way. There is freedom in Christ. There is eternal life that is absolutely possible. 
And so, <clears throat> these 3,000 men of Judah come to him and he says, look, just promise me you won't kill me yourselves. In other words, because I know the Spirit of God will come on me. And I could kill all you guys, but I don't want to do that because you're on my side. Although, you know, they were betraying him. So they said, no, we won't do, you, do that. They said, we'll tie you up and deliver you into their hand. We will not kill you. They found him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. When he came to Lehi, the Philistines shouted as they met him, and the spirit of Yahweh came mightily on him. The ropes that were on his arms became as charred flax, and his ropes dropped off his hands. He found a fresh jawbone of an ass and struck down a thousand men with it. Well, I think that shows that Samson was not like a man with ripply massive muscles. He only got his specific sort of whoosh of power by the Spirit of God when it was needed. Right? So he was all weak while the men of Judah were tying him up and then, oh right, the Philistines are coming, oh he's got all this power. He can just get rid of the ropes, picks up whatever was lying around, fresh jawbone of an ass, and he hits uh, and kills a thousand Philistines with it. It's clearly by the Spirit of God. And so, when you come to the New Testament, you read about men being filled with the Spirit of God. But when you read through the Acts of the Apostles, you read about the same people being filled with the Spirit of God on multiple occasions. So I would say that Yes, God gives you his spirit, fills you with it, but it is to do a specific thing at a specific time, and then you need to be filled up again. And that's our life, that you may come to church, get filled up, or, or you may come to uh, read the Bible, uh, and it, just looking at something as, as you're on the bus and you're reading half a chapter, you go, oh wow, that's incredible, and you're filled again. And that's our, our experience now. Now, we said that Samson, last time we looked at it before, Samson was a Nazirite. And he was a Nazirite to God. And that was someone who was not a priest, he was not from the tribe of Levi, who was able to dedicate themselves to God and be his person for the period. Well, God said, he will be a Nazirite unto me. He was to be a Nazirite to God. That's what the angel said to his mother. Your son will be a Nazirite to God. From his birth. The Nazarite couldn't drink alcohol, or else the Nazarite ship ended, couldn't touch an unclean animal, couldn't touch a dead body, and must not have their hair cut. Well, Samson actually pretty well breaks all of that. And yet he was still a Nazarite to God. God saw him as a Nazirite, although he kept breaking the Nazirite conditions. And one of those conditions was not to touch a dead body. Well, he broke that when he, when he took the honey out of the carcass of the lion. He broke that when he killed 30 men in Ascalon and took their, took their clothes off them, touched their bodies. And now he thinks, oh, how can I kill these blokes? Ah, oh, what's lying around? Well, God could have made a, a jagged flintstone be lying around, but he didn't. There was a fresh jawbone of a donkey. Oh, right, that'll do. And it wouldn't have been that strong. A fresh bone of a donkey, I don't think is that strong. You'd have expected him to have found, as I say, a jagged flintstone. But God knew what he was doing, and I think he, he's trying to show Samson that, yeah, I know, you touching a fresh jawbone of a dead donkey that makes you unclean but I'm still going to work for you and he, I can't put this right to you but what I want to say is that people think that because they're imperfect because they are still sinning God can't work through them or that that's a deal breaker now if I push down that path too far you would all Go home thinking that, oh great, we can continue in sin. Great, oh, I love listening to Duncan. He says that we can continue sinning. You, we are not to continue in sin, the grace may abound. I'm not saying it's all okay. I'm not saying Samson's okay. Definitely not. But, on the other hand, no one can stop sinning, unfortunately. And we are as we are. But that is not a deal breaker. And this is the good news of Jesus Christ. 
This is why we are here to take the bread and the, and the juice in memory of him. Because through him, through his work, sin is not a barrier. And actually sin was never ultimately a barrier to God. Despite Samson being as he was, God is telling him all the time, yes, Daniel? Right, we are not to continue in sin in the sense of saying, oh, well, great, we can continue sinning. Guys, isn't that great? That's, that's what that means. But you balance that against the fact that we are all sinners. And as John says, if anyone says he doesn't sin, he, he's lying. And so God is sort of trying to make Samson see that. He says, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll save um, through a, a jawbone of a donkey. And if you touch it, you'll be unclean. Break the Nazarite vow, but okay, you're still a Nazarite to me. Now, in the book of Judges, God saves people through these judges, but by very weak things. For example, this woman, Jael, kills um, the enemy general with a tent peg. With a tent peg. There was a bloke called Ehud, who who was left-handed, we're told. Well, to us, it doesn't matter if you're right or left-handed. Back in those days, if you were left-handed, you were a weirdo, you were definitely a bad person. But the guy with his left hand, so every is left-handed, no, I'm not getting it anyway. So sure, oh, well, all, all the clever clogs here, all, anyway. Um, and it says that he took a dagger with his left hand and stuck it inside the fat stomach of this uh, king, Eglon. And it just emphasises it. I know for us right left-handed it means nothing, but back in the day, even in my time in Albania, if you were left-handed, you couldn't be a school teacher nor a government official, government worker. And that's in recent times, as in my time, our time. And so, way back in the day, left-handed, no, that, that was not okay. And yet God worked through him. The same here, through, I would say, a relatively weak jawbone of a donkey. And he kills a thousand men with it. And he keeps saying that he killed a thousand men. Samson said, as sort of a victory song, with the jawbone of an ass, heaps on heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, I've slain 1,000 men. The law of Moses said that if you are faithful to the covenant, if you are with God, one man will kill a thousand. And Samson's on his own. He says, there you are, see, I, I, I'm the one man who killed 1,000 men. Because God has said, if you're faithful to me, one man shall kill a 1,000. And he said, oh, that's what I did. But was he faithful to God? All you can say is, um, yes and no. <coughs> Are you faithful to God? Am I faithful to God? I won't say no. I won't say, oh yes, I, I am piously wonderful. No. Yes and no. That's, that's the answer. But the point is that God looks on that and sees the positive. So when he'd finished speaking, he threw away the jawbone, and that place was called Ramath uh, Jawbone Hill, you translate it. He was very thirsty and called on Yahweh and said, you've given this great deliverance. By the hand of your servant, now shall I die for thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised? Do you know, in all the Samson story, that's the first prayer that he makes. That's the first prayer. It's not like with all these other incidents that he prays to God, Oh God, please give me strength. Please give me strength to, um, you know, uh, kill all these people. No, no, he just does it. He comes over very proud and arrogant. And so I think God just taps him, touches him. But yeah, yeah, you won this great victory, but you're so dehydrated that you're going to die from dehydration. Oh, God, yes, he says, you've given to me, your servant, this great victory. Ah, oh, he's coming down humble now. He's coming down cool. Uh, but shall I die for thirst? Or like, oh, please give me some water. You know? And that's often what happens, that God will just tap, tap, just nudge you to make you realise your, your mortality. That's what he does. And to bring you back. 
And as I say, this is how the Spirit of God works in human life. Gently, I would say, by nudging and, 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 and just hinting. And so that's what he does here. So God spit the hollow place that is in Lehi, and water came out of it. When he drank, his spirit came again, and he revived. Therefore his name was called en Hakori. This is the, uh, the spring of the one who, who cries to God, uh, which is in Lehi to this day. So as I understand it, God opened a fountain, a spring, on the top of Jawbone Hill. Now, springs and fountains, wells, etc., you don't get them on the top of a hill. You get them on the, in the valley. And he says, that's why it's called, you know, it's, it's specially remembered to this day. And all the way through the Samson story, you see these odd things, like a, a spring appears on the top of a hill, and, uh, well, everyone always remembers a story, because there's a spring on the top of that hill, there's a fountain there. Well, that's odd. It's like Samson kills the lion, it turns into a carcass, and the bees hive in the carcass and produce honey. Bees don't hive in dead bodies. Bees don't hive in carcasses. All the time, God is just giving the message. I am working, but I work through just the indirect ways. And that's what you see in your life. If you want to see God in your life, you will see him in all these ways. And this bit of the story finishes that he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines for 20 years. To judge means to save, to lead, to save. That's the Hebrew word, that's the idea. And it says that he did this for 20 years. And there's a strange comment by Samuel later on, where he says, Yahweh sent Jeroboam, Bidan, Jephthah, sorry, I mistyped that, uh, and Samson, and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side, and you lived in safety. If you get up at Samuel, there's Samson. Not uh, Samuel. So he's saying that um, God, God sent Samson and saved you through him from your enemies, and you lived in safety. Uh, isn't that a bit strange? Because when you read the record of Samson, it's like four or so incidents of him being mad angry, driven by vengeance, his anger problem, <coughs> his lust, beating up on people. But God says he saved Israel. Yes, then. Well, we don't have an anger problem. God huh? just like when really, you like punish people who are saying they have problems. Yep. So why don't you like, you never like dress up like, you know, something like that or anything like that. You just, you helped him with it, didn't you? You didn't, you know, say you're bad. I mean, you didn't well, really address it. Yeah, he didn't really address it. That's right, he didn't address it. Samson's anger problem. Yeah, that's a good observation. Um, what well, my point is was that God, by grace, God was still gracious even even in the Old Testament. His grace is a fundamental part of His characteristics. It wasn't just in the New Testament; it was revealed it was here in the Old Testament as well. And what I wanted to say was that, according to that that Samson apparently judged Israel for 20 years. And according to Samuel, later on, Samson saved them from their enemies on every side. But that's not the impression you get when you read the account of Samson. He marries or tries to marry an unbeliever. He's got a massive anger problem, kills people. And here he, he likewise gets very cranky. Chapter 16, he goes and sleeps with a prostitute in Gaza, and then he gets involved in this stupid relationship with Delilah, who betrays him. And then he's, his eyes are taken out, and he dies uh, in prison, basically. Well, what's the point of all that? Well, this is the point. That on one hand, we're told he judged Israel for 20 years. But when you actually read the story, you're reading the very worst parts of his life. And I think God did that to make us scratch our heads and think. Because for you and me, if God was to write up our story and focus on certain particularly bad things we did at various times, right, as it were, take a video clip of you swearing. So uh, they're just judging you. 
No, no, wait, let, let me finish. Um, it, it's as if God is saying, look at this guy who served me for 20 years, and Hebrews 11 says he's going to be saved. But do you know what? At various points in his life, he didn't half behave badly. And that is every one of us, even the most pious. At certain points in our lives, we messed up. And if a video clip had been taken of you in your very low moment, on whatever it was, the 6th of June, uh, 3, 3.31 p.m. Someone in the head. Right, okay. Well, so I'm not forgiven for that then. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. So Tony, really? goes, Tony has volunteered an example. Now, when he's in Iraq, in the army, he, he killed a bloke, a, a short range, yeah? Shot him in the head. Woman. Right. A woman. Right, okay. So, a woman. so Tony shot a woman uh, uh, in the army at uh, close range in the head, killed her. Right. If you, and I'm sure he did many other bad things. So, if you were to put. Well, I did drink a lot. Okay. If you. In the past tense. <laughs> so if, if, you put, if, if you put all those bad points of Tony together, you'd say, what a terrible bloke Tony is. Yeah, he's but, but, just hold it there. It's the same with Samson. He went a, a prostitute. He, he, he did this and he did that. But then God says, but he's going to be saved. And he actually led my people for 20 years. So you see, despite the bad points in every life, not just Tony's life, exactly. but everybody's life, God yes. sees you overall in a different way. Yes, Daniel? Will you kill someone in the end and not be a sin? Because it says rational murder. Now, why that be in the Old Testament? Like, you, if you killed someone in the end, wouldn't you, like, you wouldn't like murder them because you like, would kill them, but like, you wouldn't despise them with your heart. Tonight. Well, whatever. It wasn't the greatest thing to do. It, it wasn't the greatest thing to do, yeah. right? But you, you didn't like hate them with your heart. Yeah, right, you didn't hate them. Yeah, so you didn't. But you didn't love them either. Right. I, and so this, this is actually the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because now we're going to take the bread and the, and the cup, you can pass it around. Um, that we are sinners. And if you looked at each of us, at our weakest moments. It's not, a, it's not a great picture, right? But we are sanctified, we are justified, and that means to be counted righteous. You read Romans, Paul's on about it, justification by faith, that we are counted righteous. God looks at us as if we are wonderful because we are in Christ. So now do you get why I keep saying to people come back to our place and be baptised into Jesus Christ not into any church, not any religion but into Christ because by being in him you are covered in him, you are counted righteous, God sees you in a different way God looks at you as if you are Jesus Christ and for those of us who have been baptised, the wonder of it, you know, don't let it be lost upon you. Don't let it be lost upon you. That we are in Christ. And that we are looked at as if we are him. That we who are no good are taken uh, uh, as if we are Jesus. And this is all possible because of what we are now going to remember. We remember his body through the bread, his blood, his life through the cup, right? that this was for us. This was for us. And by, uh, let's say, by, by taking the bread and the cup, we are showing that, yes, I identify with myself with him as he does with me. I in him he in me. He becomes a part of me. And I become a part of him. And this is the wonder of it all. This is what love does. Love looks at the beloved very positively. As if he or she is wonderful. Right, let's give thanks for the bread and the, and the cup.
Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great work for us, for your great love for us, and what that means, that you raised me up to more than I can be. We thank you, Father, that you do that, that you make us more than we can be because of your grace and because of our location, as it were, in your Son and our connection with him and your justifying of us as you did your, your servant Samson. We just thank you for his sake. Amen. 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 Right, let's give thanks for the food. Maybe Cindy, could you give us a, give us a prayer for the uh, for the food?